stare oblivion in the face and dare to hope. Burn Bright is the first ever tabletop role-playing game made exclusively for and by Roll20. It's a science fantasy role-playing game that takes place in the Olaxis galaxy. Olaxis is a place of fantastic creatures, magic-powered tech, and ancient ruins. The problem? This is the last galaxy in existence, and it's shrinking. A bright orange phenomenon called the Burn surrounds and closes in on Alaxis, wiping out anything it touches. Anyone's home could be next. Resources grow scarce as planets are lost to the phenomenon. Refugees struggle to find welcoming spaceports. Wars are fought over the planets at Alexis's center, the last to be taken by the burn. And the ever-diminishing edge of the galaxy is rife with criminals and bizarre space-faring monsters chased by the burn from parts unknown. To make matters worse, greedy villains exploit panic caused by the burn for profit. That's where you come in. Each player builds a character, selecting one of Burnbright's eight original species, like a super-focused crystalline Ulrin, a sapient mecha called a Peacecraft, or a swarm of tiny telepathic insects that share a hive mind known as the Rornin. Yeah, that's right, you can be a swarm. Your characters put it all on the line to help those in need, the end of the universe is no reason to stop having a heart, and overwhelming odds are no reason to abandon hope. Beat corruption with a sonic caber, and shield the innocent with force fields as you travel the galaxy in your customizable spaceship. As your characters adventure, they grow more powerful, gaining skill upgrades, new species traits, and completing story paths. Each story path is a unique five-element plot that grants your character unique abilities. The outcome of each event determines how your character's power increases. When you finish the story path, you can immediately start a new one. Good thing there's 40 to choose from. Tracking your character's progression, conditions, and gear is easy with Roll20's fully integrated Burn Bright character sheet and compendium. Building your character is fast and easy thanks to Roll20's Character Mancer. Hey, even your crew's spaceship has a character sheet for tracking shared resources and upgrades. Game Masters, you focus on your player's characters. Roll20 can take care of the rules. Instantly roll fistfuls of virtual dice and easy to understand resolutions. Build custom character adventures with less prep time by letting your character's story paths guide you. You can pick up the core rules, map tile packs, and a starter adventure called Burning Daylight, which comes with quick start rules, pre-generated characters, and dynamic lighting-ready maps, so you can jump right into the game and take on a mysterious cult that worships the burn. You can purchase the core rules, map pack, and adventure separately, or get it all in our Burn Bright Mega Bundle, which saves you 10 bucks and gives you access to an exclusive character art pack. I know what you're thinking. Don't worry, more Burn Bright content is coming after launch. I can't wait to see you in Alaxis. Let's dare to hope. So I really think uh, the whole ploy of me doing this, honestly, was because now I want to run this game 10 times more, and it is a beautiful problem to have. So hi, I am Gabe, Gabe James Games on Twitch, Twitter, and pretty much anywhere else on the internet. Today I am on Roll20 to go through a GM walkthrough of Burn Bright, the first tabletop role-playing game designed specifically for Roll20. Now there is so much to unpack about this game, so I'm going to do my best to give you the tools, understanding, and excitement that you can so you can run your own Burn Bright session. So, first off, just, just so that you're aware of this, there is a website that you can go to directly if you have any questions. Literally, burnbright.com. You can see the video that I told you about. You can get features, news, you can buy it through there. There is so much information here and even, even just little synopsis. Burn Bright is a game about hope against all odds and doing what's right, even as the universe burns around you. 
And if that wasn't a fitting analogy for 2020, I don't know what is. Um, I absolutely love space. I like it's it's one of my favorite just things to delve into, even though it's terrifying. So when I can play it in games, I'm all for it. And I started looking into Burn Bright because I love convenience and Roll20 gives that since it's all digital and it does like any math for you. It does all the rolls for you. It's fantastic. But before I get too caught up in just hyping it up for myself, let's let's talk more about it. Um, Burn Bright has a character mancer inside of Roll20, which will make designing characters significantly easier. And if you are the person running the game, one of the best things is being able to give your players tools and have them just run with them. And initially, when I wanted to look at Burn Bright, I sat down and opened the character mancer and started making a character with no previous knowledge of anything about the game other than I could be a gigantic swarm of insects and that there may or may not be a gigantic space burn that may or may not be consuming most of the universe. But again, again, <laughs> that's for later. So this game was designed by James Entrosco, Jim McClare, Cat Cool, and Darcy Ross. Another thing that's beautiful is it has an inbuilt safety tools system, and we're gonna dive into that. So I've talked about this so much, I have hyped it up, it is, something that I'm genuinely very excited to dump into. So the first thing we're going to do is just jump into the game. So what I have here is I actually have one of the the first module actually for it called Burning Daylight. And we have a couple shows that run on Roll20 that are playing through Burning Daylight. They are Against the Stars, an actual play produced and presented by Salty Sweet Games at 6 p.m. on Tuesdays. And we also have Burning Daylight, which, if I remember correctly, airs on Thursdays. Yes, yes. So there are safety tools included, and it's normalized, which is the way it should be. That's the beauty of, like, creation and development, especially when you normalize things that we should have in games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, you know what? We're going we're gonna to jump into it. Literally, when you start, there is a, a bunch of different options and rules and information, and it's separated already. So you don't have to search for things. You don't have to like click through a bunch of pages. I love that. Um, being able to just look for skills and be able to just click skills and it's right there, having that pre-built in function saves so much time. And again, if you are someone who is running this game, the really nice thing about the way this is set up is that most of this stuff is separated for your players in significantly easier ways to understand. If you wanted to say, let's all just click open the skills tab, it is right there for everyone to do. But we're going to go right to start here. So we're going to look through this. We're going to look through a little bit of the burning daylight, but I'm not going to give you too much because I want you to pick it up and I want you to get a chance to play through it. But I'm going to use specific examples that are just general play so that we can see what it's like. So if you get Burning Daylight, it comes with five pre-generated characters, which again is fantastic because then it saves you a lot of time. It saves you understanding and once you see how the characters work, I'm gonna keep rambling about it because that's what I do when I'm excited. Um, I'm going to sit with you and we're going to make a character together that will act as if is our player when we're running through the campaign. So first off is the character mancer, which if you have never used a roll 20 character mancer, it is one of the most convenient character creation experiences you will ever have, even if you don't understand the system. So step-by-step -step process that makes building a character simple and streamlined. Right off the bat, we're gonna start with species. Now this is a personal preference. I like that species was the choice. There is dozens of differences but I like species because then we get the differences and all of this stuff all of the different species types are built in we have the glean which are feathered aquatic sapiens who require the assistance of magic powered implants called reliquaries to survive for more than a few years which is intense and terrifying and I love them 
uh, we have the Driftling. So the Driftling, I, when, I, when I discovered the Driftling, I wasn't sure if I wanted to make dozens of them myself and just put them out in the universe for my players because they're infinitely plastic organ organisms with no definite form. So the Driftling that we see here can be nothing like the Driftlings that we will see in other circumstances. Also, ignore me. It is very warm. But so, these Galactic Travelers are in constant physical flux and take on the form of whichever creatures they spend the most time with. So, if you have Driftlings in one universe versus Driftlings in another or just different planets, they will most likely look different. They're adaptable, ugh, adaptable individuals. So they come from Ardon, a complex planet of high preda predation, rich with plasma. To survive, they evolved the ability to take on the traits of other creatures, which helped them both avoid predators and catch their own prey. The harsh environment made Driftlings value physical prowess, direct communication, and decisiveness. Before I get too deep into each of these different species, I want to go into the different ones and then we'll pick one that we really want to delve into because again i'm going to keep saying it this is the gm walkthrough i don't want to show you everything because i want to leave exciting things for you to delve into so we'll next we'll look at the eno the fact that i can be a feline person in space don't at me uh, so they are feline humanoids with bodies fit for sneaking and infiltration and minds inclined to manipulation and secrets. And you'll see below, some of them actually have distinctions. So distinctions are different ways. It's, it's almost as if there's variations to the way that species is. Like there is ore, there is tin, there's seal. And it shows you the most mystery, mysterious of the houses. So they're different houses, they're different options. And it adds a bit more lore to your character and to the characters that you have and with that different lore, for example, maybe you had an entire group of players who wanted to play in Eno. And all of them were the same house or a different house. Or there was one house that they didn't use. Or you wanted to create an outside house that had an experience. The, the beauty of this is that there's options they give you that are narrative. But at least for me, it doesn't feel like too much. Sometimes having too much can be overwhelming, especially as a person who is trying to tell a story. Then we have the Kithuk. The Kithuk are insect eh, insectoid warriors with friendly dispositions and a close-knit society. I'm a really a big fan of this design, especially the horns, and I can't tell where the mouth is, and honestly that, that makes it, it could literally be on the head, it's great. Peace crap. okay, I'm biased because I love mechs. And these are organic, sapient mecha outfitted for war who desire peace when is the last time you got to play or literally have a group of characters that were literally living mechs the rorden these are the ones that i had mentioned previously each rornan hive consists of tiny telepathically linked insects with a single collective mind I love the concept and it absolutely terrifies me. So each hive moves and acts as one being. It never outlines the size either. So they could be enormous, they could be small, the color could be different. I have a lot of feelings and I'm really trying to keep composed and get through everything together. So we have the Ulran. The Ulran are crystalline humanoids who harden as they age. As the sapiens who first harness magic to make spacecraft, they are excellent pilots. I really like the fact that they harden as they age because it makes it makes sense. It's almost like because the idea as as infants we have very soft and malleable bodies, and then after time it hardens to a good point, but they are consistently their body is still consistently changing. And this one threw me. This is something that I never expect, expected to see in a game and I was actually very here for. I'm not positive it's Zyboy or Z-Boy and I will ask James about that just so I can have the double clarification. I've said Zyboy. The Zyboy are large slugs that can change their form and inhabit the corpses of other creatures. Now if this 
is not a species that literally just gives you options for how to tell a story. I cannot think of what is. Zavoy. Okay. I like that. But you know what? Let's let's start off with an ion because I'm biased. Ha, ah, so space slugs weren't creepy. Yeah, I love space slugs. Alright, so we're gonna go with the Eno though. And just dove into it. Then the next thing after species is culture. So there are different systems that characters can be in. And as you're building your world, you can either select one of the systems that already exists or the character creation literally gives you the option to make a custom culture based off of a system. So if you are playing in the pre-built universe, you have these options that you can use. If you are making your own, if you want to make your own system that the players all come from, you can make that here too. I'm going to just have one of the generalized systems we have here and I'm going to expand it a little bit so you can actually see the cultures because the cultures go into borders, diversity, economics, and density. And the nice thing about this system, if you click it, it will just go right to it, the table of contents. So you're building a culture, borders. The different borders are open. Open cultures allow people and refugees to pass, visit, and reside freely. Though they may have some requirements for entry, such as border authority that asks questions of visitors before allowing them to enter. And I've said it before, and I will repeat it again. If you are the person who is running this game, as your players, as you're building this world, these questions that it's asking the characters in the beginning are also helping you set up for what you want your area to be. Because if you're creating a system, what is the culture like in that system? So I actually, I actually said that I was going to pick one, but I'm going to actually make a culture that I want to do here. And I think I want the area to be is an open culture. And this is, this is actually going to give bonuses to your character, but we'll get into that. Then there's the density. What is the density of that culture like? I'd say it's actually fairly suburban. And that affects how much money they have. Argent. Uh, and I say money very loosely because Argent is... Essentially, living organisms that grow and develop, and that is what the main currency is. Which, again, just the beauty of that, the fact that it's, it's an entity, it's an existence, it's not just paper, it's not just coins. Um, I'm very excited. So we'll go into the diversity of it, actually. Diversity. Does your character come from a culture where many different species live and work together, a culture that is predominantly one species, or a place where different species live together, but generally in separate neighborhoods. Off the bat, I like that, I like that the options aren't harsh because it feels like it's, it's giving you an emphasis of how did it start, but it's not leading you towards a path that is negative or leading you towards a path that is hard or sad. And you can build those stories but it's not off the bat saying that that's the way you should lean. And I feel like as your players make these characters, especially if, if they're looking at diversity, there's value to each of these different, each of these different options. But I'm gonna go with inclusive. And economics. So, you know what? We'll make them intermediate. They're not that rich, but they do have experience. And I'm just gonna go right next. Story path. I love the story path because as a GM, it makes what I'm doing for my players 10 times easier. The story path, each, each character picks a story path. And as you saw in the video, there's a bunch. Let me, like there is genuinely a lot. So. I like, the, I like the idea that this character we have, they have feline aspects. Um, one of the options is Beast Friend. So we're gonna look at what the story path for Beast Friend is. And you know, we're just, we're gonna delve into what story paths are. Story paths are arcs of narrative growth that your character experiences. And this makes running the game significantly easier in my opinion, because then the players are selecting specifically a path that they want to follow. 
And it gives me the tools, the idea, the understanding of what things I can put into the story to reach those paths. The past can concern anything from romance, to mastering a skill, to going on the run. And when all of them are laid together, they show your narrative as a hero. So right off the bat, I selected Beast Friend. And let's, let's go into Beast Friend. You bond with an animal who means more to you than a typical beast of burden or pet. The experience you share make you close friends. This path is for a person who wants to explore role-playing a character who has an animal pal. The animal you make friends with must use the standard, weak, or minion animal statistics and can have one of the following special abilities. So it's giving you the option to have the animal companion. But it's not just that it's just a mechanical aspect of the game. There is narrative and mechanical value to having this. And right off the bat, we see first meeting. So first meeting. You complete this event after you meet an animal and show it some form of kindness. You can give the animal food, heal its wounds, save it from a hunter or cruel caretaker, or provide something else it needs. The end result of this event should have the creature staying by your side for a while. Reward. Increase the die size of your empathy, knowledge, medicine, or perception skill by one. I'll go into the die size after this because that's also one of my favorite parts because it makes the game easy to understand. But right here, it gives you a narrative event to strive for. And it's not saying that you have to do a check. It's not saying that you have to meet a goal. It's giving you a narrative guide of an event to create, of an event to happen. And so if I have a player with this, I know right off the bat, okay, so that's their first event. At some point, I'm just gonna keep introducing different animals and see which one they take to. And that doesn't take, that doesn't take as much new planning from me. It gives me building blocks and a foundation to use. And that's the stuff I love because when my players can have an easy time, it gives me an easy time. And there's rewards for the players when they reach those narrative goals. Then there's the second, third event. Second, third event. Fifth event. And there's different options for what the second or third event could be. And as you go through it, you get rewarded for it. That's, that's a design aspect that I love. Because when you're running a game, oftentimes you have to figure out, when do I reward my players? How much should I reward my players? How should I reward my players? It's nice that this game gives us the ability to have guidelines for it. You can reward them in dozens of other ways if you want to, but this is a specific way that you can do it that requires one less thing to plan that out. And there are a bunch of different story paths. There is battle, there is discovery, there is face fear, and uh, some people might even specifically prefer love. And the first event is a love connection, but we'll find that out later. So skills, 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 skills. Let's talk about why running this game requires way less math from players, the person telling the story, the person narrating the story, any of it. Because the way skills work, you are given a skill difficulty, which is from two to six, two to seven, excuse me. I'm over here narrating it and I have it here. When it's time for a character to make a skill roll, the character's player picks the skill being used. Before making the roll, the player must declare the skill they want to use and explain how the skill applies in the situation. So, let's come up with a circumstance. There is someone who sees a machine that is on and the machine is blowing out acidic gas into the air. And the player says, I want to stop that machine. So it's a narrative conversation between player and GM about how to do it. If the skill makes sense for overcoming the challenge, the GM tells the player the skill rules complexity and then the character makes the roll. So this is a circumstance of where you say, okay, I see the gas coming out of that. I'm going to try and make a computer check. And then I'll, okay, how would you like to make the computer check? Well, I would like to go and I want 
to go into the program and I want to actually see if I can manually turn it off. Fantastic, make your roll. And it comes to a circumstance where someone says, I want to stop it from happening. I want to smash the machine. Okay, so what do you, what do you, how are you trying to destroy the machine? I'm gonna try and just melee, just actual attack. Okay, let's see how that, that let's, the, I feel like the complexity for that would be a four versus maybe if they're doing computers, it's a two. So it's giving you the gauge of having the conversation. There's, there's a lot of responsibility when it comes to being the person running the game. So when you have a situation where the game is ax like actually asking the players to think of how they want to do it and what skills they want to use instead of relying on the GM to tell them, it's nice. It's nice because then you get that idea, that narrative direction. Then I'm not automatically assuming someone's going to be like, okay, well, they're automatically going to use computers to stop this machine or saying computers is the only way it can be done. If someone tells me they have a way to use Streetwise to stop a machine from releasing toxic gas in the air, you better believe I'm excited to hear it. It's that interaction that makes a difference and this enthuses that interaction. So you see D4, D8, D6, D4, D4. That is the die that is being used for the skill roll. So it should be here. And I'll go into it, I'll go into it more. When you roll a skill, you always roll at least two die. And you roll at least two die because that is the minimum difficulty. When you pass a roll, you pass because the two die in that circumstance are not the same. So this is why in, in the previous uh, story, it gave an option when you met this goal, you could upgrade a die. So we'll say that my computer die would actually go from D4 to D6. The value of that is because now if I have a difficulty check that is, let's say it's a three it would require me to roll three die. Now that it's a D6, I can roll any number from between one and six. That is a significantly easier chance to not get doubles. And it doesn't require any math. I will make that a selling point for anyone who's trying to find a game to run. And one of the biggest issues that you encounter is that you have to keep doing math for dozens of things all over. Because that is something that I struggle with. One of my biggest struggles is, especially if I'm running a game for a bunch of people, keeping track of the math of everything that's happening is hard. And it is possible you will have to take a bunch of notes. And it's not that it's a bad thing, but it is a big challenge. This removes a lot of that challenge. This removes you having to decide, okay, well, it's going to be a 15 total, a 20 total, a 30 total. This is instead giving you the gauge, okay, how difficult is it on a scale of two to seven? I, you know what, I'll actually, I'll even show you how the roles work. Um, there is more of the character creation stuff here. So there is any of them are a D6, any a D8, D10, D12. So when you're, you have the four die to choose from, a D6, D8, D10, D12, as your skills are going higher, they all start at D4. Right here, it's telling me what ones are just automatically like lower or where I can put these things. So any could be a D6, any could be a, like any two could be a D8, any one could be a D10. And they already have some split up a little bit here. And I don't want to focus as much on the character creation for the skills as I do for running, running the game. But again, if you have any questions, let me know. I am looking through this stuff. I'll try to go through this as much as I can. Um, I hope that even, even just now, we've been sitting here talking about this for about 30 minutes. And if you understood the majority of how this works, I would literally say that you could run this game. You could run this session and know what you were doing. Well, okay, let's stay. Uh, da -da. Nah. Abilities. Abilities do come into play from the character types that you are, from the species that you picked. A reason that I like this section, and you're going to get reasons 
that I like this in each of the sections because there are each things that I like. There are specific like abilities that are related to the species. Then there are ones that you get the option to pick. And one of the things that are related to options are Nova points. And there's different Nova skills. I don't want to overwhelm you with everything, so I'm just going to pick a few skills just so you can see some of the ideas that are in this game. And then we'll go over what the character sheet is, how it works, and why it works. Uh, edge in the dark. Reduce complexity. Yeah, let's do it. There's also finding equipment. There is a bunch of equipment. So this is talking more about the Argent. Um, yeah, I was passive, none of the dice are saying Yes, yeah. And that, so that's, again, that's why it's the difficulty. That's why you want to have different skills that have the higher die, but you don't want to just emphasize solely on that. So I'm exiting out of that because we have character sheets that we can already use. And this one is a pregen of essentially where we were. So I had talked about the skill rolls and somebody had asked me for an example. This is a prime example. Um, let's say that someone is trying to navigate quietly into, into a bar without being seen. And it's on a relatively busy street. So in my opinion, it's probably relatively, it's, it's a little complex, but it's not terrifying. This is what happens when you pop up when you're trying to make that skill roll. It will literally ask you, what is the complexity of the roll? Right here. And you know what? I would say it's a four. It's not terrible, but it is, it isn't super easy. There's no condition bonus. There's not affected by that. Literally just roll. And right here we see, I rolled a six, a six, an eight, and a one. Right here shows you exactly why. It was a failure because I rolled two sixes. But let's just, let's just take a chance again. That was another failure. But I'm going to try one more time. I don't think I have good luck. And now I'm a little more reserved to run this game because I feel like, well, actually, no, it'd be good because I don't have to make any rules. Really? God, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. But do you see? So it shows you right there everything that is happening. It shows you the rules that are being made. It shows you that it's a physical skill. It shows you the die that it's using. And it even gives you a little description of what's happening. Apparently, Gabe doesn't have very much luck uh, in a player sense of running this, but you know what? I think when it comes to running as a GM, it probably works out for the players. Now, a second beautiful aspect of this game before we dive too far into characters. I mentioned it previously, and it is one of the things that is the most important. The safety deck. This is a handout directly in the game. Every game in Roll20 with a burn bright character sheet comes a deck of infinite cards that allows the players to inform the GM and each other when they feel unsafe and when they feel safe during a game. Gaming is for everyone and the number one goal of burn bright is for the people playing the game to have fun. I cannot emphasize how important that is. And in the rules, it states, no questions asked. When a person places a card on the table, the group should pay attention and follow the rules on the card without asking who placed the card or why the card was placed. These are rules distinctly built into the game. These are necessities distinctly built into the game. I cannot emphasize that enough. There is a keep going card. The keep going card is green and an indicator to others that you're currently enjoying the content that's occurring. You don't have to play it, but sometimes you can just play it when you're excited. If a player does something absolutely ridiculous and you love it and you want to make sure that they don't feel like they're taking up too much of your time, they're taking up agency from the story, that's a great time to play the keep going card. And I, I love to see that. If this is something that I like as a GM 
Because if there's a circumstance where I'm monologuing about something absolutely ridiculous, absolutely wild, and I see a player put down a keep going card, it also makes me feel good. Because then I feel like I'm telling a good story. I feel like I'm doing something that's fun. And this is a nice way that both players and GMs can be enthused, can get a little bit of praise, can get a little bit of feedback. Have you ever considered how often the GM does not necessarily get that? And it's not that if it's a requirement, but it's nice that this is built in for that. Then there's a slowdown card. It's yellow and an indicator to others that you are fine with the current content of the game, but going further with the description would make you uncomfortable or unsafe, or just feel unsafe. And safety is one of the most important things in gaming, especially as it becomes more available. We deserve to feel safe we need to feel safe when we're playing a game. There's no reason not to. So this is a circumstance where if someone is describing something that's uncomfortable, oftentimes people are uncomfortable with graphic violence, and reasonably so. And this is a great circumstance where you can play that card and just let people know. Then there is the stop card. The stop card is red and is an indicator to others that you feel uncomfortable or unsafe and want the current content of the game to end. Anything that is graphic, anything that makes you uncomfortable, anything that's just too much, this is the time and moment to play that card. And as I said before, it is outlined specifically in the rules, no questions asked. People should not have to, you, there, is, there is never a reason you should ever have questioned if something makes you uncomfortable. Enough said. Very passionate. <laughs> But the fact that it's built in, it's, I don't see it enough. And it makes me genuinely happy to see it. So I had mentioned to you previously, Nova Points. Nova Points are also a reward system that I feel like gives players a reason to have variety in their characters. When you make your character and you're selecting your abilities, some of the abilities you select will be abilities that use Nova Points. So the abilities that use Nova Points, you have to earn a Nova Point. And you earn a Nova Point every time you get a check mark in all die size categories. So if you do a skill or a roll that involves a D4, you get a check there. And then a D6, I check there. A D8, I check there. A D10, I check there. A D12, I check there. I love that this inspires players to use things they might not feel like they're good at. This gives you a good circumstance to make them, or at least inspire them, to step out of the comfort zone. It doesn't have to just be about telling a story that you're doing something you feel like you're good with. It's just as important to tell a story that's fun because failure doesn't mean bad here. Failure means that route didn't work. Failure means that your players are going to pick a different route to do something. And especially, it's saying right here, every time they get a check mark in those categories, when they activate and use those skills, and when they use a Nova point, all the check marks are removed. But it says, anytime they make a skill roll, whether the role succeeds or fails. And that's what I like. It's saying even if you didn't succeed in your role, even if the player didn't succeed in the thing they were trying to do, they still got something out of it. There's still value to it. There's still something gained out of it. And it makes having a variety of different skills with the different, the different die values that much more important. For me as a person running the game, I love this. I want my players to feel like they can fail forward, almost. This provides it. This gives them the chance to, let's, okay. This is a prime example. I failed stealth, <laughs> but even though I failed the stealth, I still got the bonus towards the Nova point. And if we went back into that character, let's see what other skills they have. 
So, Skullduggery. And that one was actually a pass. We're getting a little bit better now. But there's a check in each of the things, and it's showing me all the die that have been used. I can check right there. It's built in to keep track of what your players have or haven't done. And so this is another circumstance. You can look at the different character sheets as the GM and see what things they haven't done if you want to try to incentivize to give them those Nova points. I love that about it. But there's still a lot more to see. And something that we haven't really delved into yet is space. When you are running this game for your players, they also start with a ship. And there are a bunch of pre-designed ships already. The one we have right here is the Bolt. Now in the top left, you can see in the map, customizable sections, ship sectors, engines, MI jack, cockpit. And it's outlined by the different colors here. Spaceship combat is something that is very prevalent in Vermbrite. And it does actually matter where the characters are located. The different areas are specific for the different actions that your players want to do. I did not realize those characters were huge. So what we're seeing here, I'm going to put a character at the engines. I'm going to put a character in the cockpit. I'm going to put a character at the MI jack. So, spaceship combat. Spaceship combat incur occurs when the player character's ship is attacked. Pirate factions, government militaries, monsters, and others patrol space for enemies and easy prey. Spaceship combat works like normal combat, and I'll dive back into normal combat, but I couldn't resist going into this. The players move around the ship and take actions to fight off their opponents, the same as normal combat. However, the vehicle movement works differently. So if you are running an account encounter of spaceship combat, when you're setting up, the player characters start by placing their tokens inside the ship. This is a really nice thing for the person running the game because it's another circumstance where this is not something you have to plan out. The players are planning out together where they want to be, what position they want, what action, what job they want to do. And that makes a difference because then my job is to purely just decide what the enemies are going to do, not figure out where all of that is happening, and there's a significantly smaller board to work with. Enemies declare the actions they're going to do, and there is multiple phases. There is the phase one. During the first phase, the GM declares the actions of the enemies and enemy vessels, just like combat. If they're going to approach, if they're going to come into attack, if they're coming in through the port near zone, or the part for, port far zone, excuse me, or the starboard zone, it gives an idea of where they are coming from. And then this is exciting because the players get to move around the ship, taking actions, and using abilities of the ship against their opponents. No single player is the pilot, the gunner, or any position. This is designed so that your players can work together to figure out what they want to do, how they want to do it together. They can move the spaceship. They can activate defense. They can enter MI space, and I'll go into MI space as well. Use a module, seal on seal a zone, extinguish a fire, repair a module. There is a bunch that can happen on this ship. And delving into space combat gives you infinite possibilities. Because what Burn, Burn Bright has done here, it's given you the tools to create these ship encounters. It's giving you the basis for these ship encounters. And it even gives you right here a setup for how it'll look. And as you build more and more yourself, you can give new experiences. You can come up with new ships, new ideas, new, new layouts. And the template, the idea of how to do it, it's all built in. 
I've talked about how I would approach this stuff a lot. And I've talked about how much I appreciate the different handouts that we see here. But this is a GM walkthrough. So let's go specifically into what does the GM do? Because in different games, you can say that the GM is a whole kinds of things. They are the storyteller. They are the one who is guiding the party. They are the one who is providing the conflict for the party. But what is a GM in Burnbright? The GM has a special role in Burnbright. As the GM, you educate the rules and keep the story going. If a situation comes up that the rules don't cover, it's your job to make the call about how to proceed and keep the story moving. It's why part of the character design is that they ask and talk to the GM about skills. It's why it's a conversation rather than telling this is or is not what happens. You are the narrator who presents challenges, story hooks, and scenes to the players. You describe the locations in Alaxis and how other people and creatures react to the player characters. In combat, you control the player character's adversaries. You control the opponents. You control a bit of the narrative and you're guiding it together. It is the GM's job to include everyone in the game. And this is a point that I feel like is very important. When you are playing a game with people, you are making a trust with those people. You are making the trust that you will make the right decision, that you will make the right choices and you will work together. No single character is the star. Each character is an equally important protagonist in the story. If you find some players aren't speaking up as often as others, be sure to ask those players what their character is doing. These are things I think should always be included in games. These are the things that people will say are implied, but it's necessary to remind you. Another part of the GM's job is to make sure everyone playing the game feels safe. I said it before, I'll say it again. People deserve to feel safe when they're playing a game with you. If you are playing on Roll20, you could be playing with strangers from the other side of the world. You might not know the personal history of everyone at the table, even the people you feel close to. The point of playing Burn Bright is to have fun. A story about the end of existence could contain all sorts of terrible things. From violence to heavy emotions, if a topic makes one of your players uncomfortable, change the scene and move on. Don't ask questions and do not bring up the subject again unless the player wants to talk about it. This was in the safety tools. It is repeated again in the GM guide, the GM notes. Your most important job as the GM is to make sure the game is fun for everyone, including yourself. You can make up rules and change the story anytime it would make the game more fun for your group. This is fantastic. This is what we need more of. This is what needs to be said more often. And I'm glad it was here. I'm glad it was here because it's something that people can see. What does the GM do? And when they click it and read it and ask, they see it. They learn about it. They know it. So. I, even, even just as a GM, the things that I want to highlight about this game is that A, story paths. Story paths literally create a narrative between the players and the GM for how you can build a narrative and it does not all rely on the GM making the story different things. It gives the GM different routes on how to guide a narrative and it gives their options. Sample story progressions. During the first session of play, Silo learns about a spaceship race around the Azabani Azab Azabni system and enters completing the challenge accepted event, the first path. After completing the event, they get a reward, which makes their suavity, uh, suavity skill go from D4 to D6. This creates a reward for the player for role playing. That is a beautiful sense and it's a great thing as a storyteller because it's a good way to involve new players. And I think that makes Burn Bright new player friendly, especially if you're someone who wants to run a game 
and you're not positive about you don't feel like you're up to up to the up to the challenge because running a running a game is a challenge but if you're worried about it and you feel like you need an extra hand i feel like this game gives you that extra hand that is one of my favorite parts the second thing i love is that even just as you're moving through a progression of when things are happening the pass fail system right there and it's by devils gives you an easy gauge of what does or doesn't succeed and it lets the it lets the game it lets the session move forward i like that it's built into roll 20 because then you have the character master i would be shocked if you spent an hour going through and you did not understand what was happening we can look through uh, special abilities. You reduce the complex uh, the complexity of skill rolls made to verbally trick or deceive others by one. So right then and there, if I was trying to do skullduggery, for example, and I'm like, okay, well, you know what? I'm a natural liar. Is there any way that I could lie my way through this circumstance? Yeah, actually. It's a prime example of a way to reduce it, reduce it by one. The rule sets for a lot of this is a narrative guide. That makes a world of a difference for me when I'm running a game because I do love rules. It is very difficult. And this is giving someone the tools this is giving someone the tools to learn how to tell a story through narrative and then add more of the rules to it. So, I have talked a lot. I want to also note that we are raising money. We are doing donations, so for every 100 raised, I think, we are giving away a copy of Burn Bright on Roll20. And if you have been here if you have been watching, if you are excited, I highly enthuse you to check it out. I highly enthuse you to donate. Uh, we are raising money for Code 2040, which is a fantastic charity. If you haven't heard of it, I think we have, actually, I think we have a chat thing as well, so I will get into that. Uh, are there any questions that anyone has for me right now about what they would do if they were running Burn Bright, anything that they want to see more of? Do you have any questions before I go forward? I want to ask. Because we've gone into skills, we've gone a little bit into Nova points. We haven't delved as much into equipment, but we can do that if you would like, because when you are running the game, you will need plenty of equipment. We haven't delved as much into language as well. Combat! I am enjoying myself. I love this game. The more that I talk about it, literally, the more I'm excited about delving into it. All right, yes, combat. That is a beautiful question. Uh, so I'm not going to go into one of the Burning Daylight pages just because I don't want to dive into it too much. Oh, I would absolutely play uh, the feline race. So part of the reason that I keep opening up the handouts and I'm reading from them as well as talking about them is because all of these handouts are built in. When you are learning, if me speaking out about the handout makes it make sense to you, then it's showing that there's a quality of the design right there. Combat occurs when other creatures intend to physically harm the player characters and vice versa. So combat occurs in rounds and each round has three phases. The phases are as follows. Enemies declare their actions. Players take actions. Enemies move and their actions resolve. The value of this is that as the enemies declare their actions, it's then giving your players the idea of what do they want to do? How do they want to react? Most of the time when a player takes an action in combat, they make a skill roll. The complexity of the roll is based on the order in which they took the action. The first action has a complexity of two, the second, act, the second action has a complexity of three. The third action has a complexity of four. Ah, you're looking at the special abilities, yeah. 
Player characters can move their movement speed once each turn without making a skill roll. So I'm going to open up the character sheet just so you can understand what we're talking about. Movement speed. Movement speed is literally based on squares. So we're going to go back into the boat just because that's where our ship was. So if this character was moving, one, two, three, nope, four, five. Because it's built on row 20, it's significantly easier just to say it's by squares. And the way that you want to describe the squares is more so up to you, but it's, it's for ease of understanding because otherwise then we have to do the math in our head and how many feet is this? How many feet is that? Is that so many feet up? And it, it can be a lot. So this is just significantly easier to follow. So this character, as it says, would move their speed. Can move their movement speed once each turn without making a skill roll. So we could say that I would move five, it would not require a skill roll at all. When a player character fails a roll, their action fails, their turn ends, and the GM gains one collapse point or gives a failure consequence. So I'm not sure if you picked up on that. When a player character fails a roll, their action fails, their turn ends. So what this is telling you is that players could take as many actions as they want if they kept succeeding. Well, seeing my luck, I don't think I take very many actions, but we'll just do a melee roll right off the bat. See how many turns we would succeed. So this, probably a complexity of three. We'll just like the map. That was an immediate fail, which means the player's turn would immediately end. I am not doing a great job right now. But we'll say that was the first roll. It was a pass. Second roll, a pass. But it actually should have been a complexity of four. That would have been a pass. So then we would have gone up to a five. So I would have gotten off the first melee. The second melee and the third would have been a failure. And that's when the turn would have ended. But if you consider the fact that you got off the two attacks, that alone, that's beautiful. Oh, that's four twos. I hate that. <laughs> so if a player character has zero health levels, they cannot take actions. And you can see what your health level is right there. Again, I like this because it's significantly less math that you have to follow. The numbers are significantly lower. It is significantly less to keep track of. So we're gonna just go straight through an entire round of combat with our lovely Eno. And I even have equipment right here. So the first thing in combat is the enemies declare actions they intend to take against the player characters. Enemies can only target player characters they're aware of. If the player characters catch all enemies unaware, skip this phase and phase three during the first round of combat. So this is outlining surprise turns. If your players come across creatures or characters that haven't seen them yet, they get what is literally a surprise. They can form, they can do their actions, and then next time the phase comes through. Once the GM, the GM then tells the players what actions each enemy intends to take and which player characters the enemies are targeting. The enemies do not move or declare their movement. These actions do not resolve during this phase. Instead, the player characters have an opportunity to react to these actions in the next phase. This is really fantastic if you have a bunch of characters that you have to manage at once. Because this is saying everything for the players happens in this phase Everything's for the enemies happen in this phase. It is not having to go through this person, 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 and then rolling all of those individuals. That is a lot to deal with. I have done it. I struggle with it. It has gotten to a point where in a lot of home games and countless systems, literally what I do is I group people together just on one initiative order because it's significantly easier. This takes all of that out. And it also means that players can change what they want to do if something goes well or if something goes wrong. They can literally do things at the same time or they could decide, you know what? This person is really good at this thing. Let's have them go first. And then if that doesn't work, then we can do this. 
you don't lose from not being able to go first. I've said I love that a lot. I will keep saying I love that a lot. <laughs> so, uh, once the GM has declared all the actions of the enemies, the combat round continues into the next phase. So, okay, we're going to pretend that Kithuk is looking at Eno. Just because I have these here, they're the pregens, we can work with them. Ignore the fact that they're fighting on the ship. It's a game of cat and bug. So we'll say that Kithuk is planning to run up to Eno and hit them. So right off the bat, this player knows what is happening. This player can act accordingly to what's happening. And it kind of shows value that if people know what happens next, it doesn't take away from the game. In fact, it actually enthuses people on what they want to do. So during phase one, the GM declares one action for each enemy. These declared actions do not resolve until phase three of the combat round. Declared actions cannot be changed after they are cleared unless the GM spends collapse points. So you remember back that it said right above, actually no, it was, uh, it was the skills. You, you no, know, it was the turn, I apologize. So you keep going until their turn ends. And they gain a collapse, and the GM either gains a collapse point or gives a failure consequence. So in this sense, when I failed, I could literally say, you know what, I'm gonna take a collapse point for that. With that collapse point, as it says, the GM can spend collapse points to change actions. This makes it so that even the players, when they're going against the GM still have a chance. This makes it so that the players, you're giving them an idea, and if you come up with an idea that you feel like may, might be better, you can change it, and it's not that it just happens commonly. It happens in a way that's still, the best way that feels is fair, honestly, the best way to say it. Enemies have their own unique attacks and actions as described in their statistics. Enemy attacks do not require dice rolls. Instead, it is up to the player characters to defend against incoming attacks by either moving out of range of the attack or taking an action on their turn to make a skill roll to defend. Let's repeat that. Enemy attacks do not require dice rolls. Beautiful. <laughs> One less thing that the GM has to keep track of. Excuse me. One last thing that the GM has to actually keep track of. <laughs> Any attacks the GM declares that are still in range of the declared target and not dodge with a skill roll, hit the player character and deal damage in phase three of the round they were declared. Using the roll 20 token markers, uh, also called status indicator overlays to track declared attacks. The GM should give each enemy a token unique, a token, a unique marker, then assign that same marker to a player character's token when the enemy declares an attack to keep track of which enemy is attacking which player character, which makes sense. And that's the beauty of Roll20. We have all of these different markers, which makes keeping track of what's happening so much easier. So, We'll say that this character was is going to move up and attack this figure. Phase two. Phase two of combat is where the player characters get to take their actions, defend against incoming attacks, and take any other actions they like. The player characters have to work together as a team to figure out the best course of action to deal with incoming threats. And I, yeah, I agree. It is beautifully cinematic. Player characters can only target enemies they are aware of. If the enemies catch all the player characters unaware, Skip this phase during the first round of combat. And side note, I'd be remiss as a, GM if I, as a GM if I didn't mention, also make sure that you hydrate when you are playing games, please. It is very important for you and your players. During phase two of combat, players' characters take individual turns in any order they choose. 
Player characters are encouraged to discuss and strategize with each other the order they want to take their turns and how to handle threats. If the player characters cannot agree on an order, the GM selects one character to go first, then the character, then that character chooses the next act, and so on until all the characters have taken a turn. It's enthusing that, okay, if no one knows who to go, you know, you should go first. And that player could be like, you know what, actually, Kithuk, they would actually have a really good idea for this next thing. They should go. And then you just go down the line. For the win, for the water. Each player character may only take one turn per round. Once a player character has chosen to start their turn, they must complete all actions they want to take before selecting the next character to act. During a player character's turn, that player character may take as many actions as they like until they fail a skill roll. As many as they like until they fail a skill roll. So humor me. So the two, it's a pass. We go complexity, it's a pass. I will never make it pass four. But this is, yeah, again, this is right here. This is exactly what it is. It would go through the actions. So if I was close enough to attack, I'd melee, melee, and then a fail. There are several types of actions that each player character can take. The most common involves the use of a skill. Players can also move, use items, and or physical abilities. Using a skill. During an encounter, player characters can use multiple skills in a turn to try and achieve as much as possible. Skills are used to attack opponents, dodge attacks, create advantages, jump chasms, terrifying, hide in shadows, pretty much anything. Below is a description of how each skill works in combat and the most common ways they're used in an encounter. So, just scrolling down. The adrenaline effect. This is where things get interesting. During combat, the complexity of skill rolls fluctuate and are dependent on the number of actions a player character has already taken. Outside of, com outside of combat, the complexity of skill rolls are static. You may wonder, why does a chasm that requires a complexity of three skill to roll across outside of battle become a complexity of two during combat? It is my first action and a complexity of uh, Complexity for skill roll if crossing it is my third. The answer is the, the, the adrenaline effect, which I think my adrenaline is pumping, which is why I keep stumbling. During life-threatening combat, not a situation engineered by the player characters for easier skill rolls, player characters start their turn with a boost of energy that helps them focus, making the first task they perform easy. So what this is saying is something that may have been significantly more challenging outside of combat during the first turn because of the adrenaline effect is significantly easier. If there is something that is dangerous, it might actually be the best time to try to do it right in the very beginning. Because the more you try to do following, the harder it'll be. Player characters can use any skill to make an attack provided it makes sense in the narrative and the GM allows it. This is a circumstance where it goes back to the narrative and the GM. This game isn't going to force you or your players to roll and act a specific way to tell a story. There may be guides that you see that are the only ways you would follow. Example, I've used melee because it makes sense if I'm trying to melee a target. But melee doesn't have to be the only option. There's power. I could legitimately try to be overpowering them. There's stealth. I could narratively say that I am moving up and trying to stealthily take out this figure. And if the if the player sells like sells me on it, if they're excited about it, there's no reason not to entertain it. Because then you get the variety. And when you get the variety, you get them using different skills. And when you get them using different skills, you get them checking off the different skills. You get them using that D8. You get them using the D4 for power. You get them using the D6 for melee. You get them to do a variety of them. And yeah, that's exactly it. Justifying each skill. Because then they get excited. 
then it gives them a new chance. Then there's the question of how do I use suave in combat? And it's going to probably be ridiculous and it's going to be a lot of fun. If you wanted a system, <laughs> if you wanted a system that will give you hijinks and it will give your players ways to be creative without you having to create those situations, I think this is the one. And if no one has used Suave in combat yet, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be. Hmm. No, 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 no. I, that's a that's a secret. That's a secret that I'll I'll have to tell you about later. But back to the attacks. So players can pick any skill they want to attack. It makes sense to the narrative and the GM. Unless an attack has its damage boosted by a weapon, special ability, or a Nova ability, it deals one damage to one target on a successful skill roll. It is not requiring. You will probably get tired of hearing me say this. It does not require significantly more math comprehension and math keeping track to make this run smoothly. I did two successful attacks, which would be two damage. And I know from each one, it is not requiring me to add up this with that, with that bonus, it is significantly easier to follow. And if someone takes a hit, boom. It's, it's one of the things I like the most about it. Because then it also opens up when you give your players items or weapons or ideas especially weapons when you give them a weapon this is a circumstance where you can skin that any way you want to really you can give them a knife you can give them an energy sword you could give them a sentient chain yeah you could give them a sentient chain for whatever reason and the damage that it's going to do is consistent because then it doesn't have to just be about the weapon doing more damage. It's exciting to see the variety that people can build with the narrative for it. So the following guidelines apply when you attack with a weapon, when you make an attack that doesn't use a weapon or a special or a Nova ability. You can attack with a mental or social skill that deals one damage to one creature of your choice within five squares of you. You can attack with a mental or social skill to deal damage. You can attack with a physical skill that deals one damage to one creature of your choice that is adjacent to you, but you may use the range skill to hurl an object at a creature within five squares. Now again, these guidelines have exceptions, determined by the GM. For instance, a GM could rule that a hacker making an attack against a robot using the computer skill can happen from more than five squares away, or that a character using a tree trunk as or that a character using a tree trunk as a weapon can deal more than one damage on a successful attack. Weapons and other items aid in making attacks. Typically, weapons deal more damage and or have better effects than attacks without weapons. The concept of a tree trunk is terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, because then you then you have the idea of who can be up front, who can handle more of the hits, and who can handle more of the damage. So, active defense, because we've gone through attacks, but defending, defending is important because our Eno right here only has three health, which means if someone better than I had rolled, they could be in trouble. Anytime a player character has an attack declared against them, any player character can make a skill roll during their turn to defend against the attack. If the skill roll succeeds, the targeted character avoids the attack and takes no damage or negative consequences from it. 
If the skill roll fails, the character does not move out of range and the attacking enemy is still in the fight. The attack hits the target player during phase three of the combat round. Note, if a player character attempts to foil an enemy's attack by moving out of range, the enemy still gets to move in phase three before the enemy action resolves and could put the player character back in range of the attack. So, if the enemy was already here, and for example, I moved, let's say over here, I could still be in range for them to make their move and put me back in range. It's making sure that players are keeping in mind they have the advantage of going first, but as the GM, after they go first, after they've done their actions, you have the advantage of following up. This is another circumstance where the GM talks to the player about what skill they want to use to justify defending. So they could try to defend through melee. They could say they're athletic, so they're trying to, trying to dodge. You could literally say that you're doing perform because they're literally dancing out of the way. Or you could even deceive, say that you're planning to move right and then you actually weave left. This is a game of conversation and, just, and justification of narrative action. I feel like that's a really good way to say it. Burn Bright is a fun way for justification to meet narrative action. Create an advantage. Advantages represent strategic advantages the player characters gain during an encounter. These points are earned when the player characters take actions to improve their strategic position. An example is uh, a character makes a knowledge field roll and learn about a strange species that invades their spaceship. On a successful roll, they learn any information the GM provides and earns an advantage, as the team is now more prepared to handle the situation. When a player character makes a successful skill roll during an encounter to gain information or narratively improve their situation, they get the advantage. And they're kept in a shared pool and can be used by any player. This gives your players a chance to do good things and help each other out just by doing those exciting, fun narrative moments. This one player doing the investigation could then give another player the chance to get rid of the encounter, get rid of the target, get rid of the enemy that they've encountered. And it builds it together. The characters have a maximum number of advantages equal to their ship's livability rating in their pool. We'll go into the ship's livability stuff, because there is a character sheet for the ship. This game didn't miss anything. So we're still in the actions. You can use items. A player character wants to use an item, needs to make a skill roll as described above. If the use of the item doesn't require a skill roll, such as like activating a torch rod, torch rod, then use of the item doesn't count as an action, although the GM does have the final say in that circumstance. You have special abilities, and players can use special abilities. Let's, let's look at our abilities that we have on the email right now. Before an ally makes a skill roll, you can spend one advantage, which we have in our pool, to reduce the complexity of a skill roll made by one. So, using special abilities during combat based on the description, if the ability states that it requires a skill roll or makes an action, then make the skill roll with the complexity based on the number of actions you have taken. To explain that, just in case, this is saying if I wanted to use my Eno Aid ability, and it does require a skill roll. Actually, so this no, this one doesn't require a skill roll. Excuse me, uh, but if it so, we'll say that it it, it, it did require a skill roll. Uh, the ability states that it requires a skill roll. It makes an attack. Make a skill roll with the complexity based on the number of actions I've taken. So we could say that I have taken four actions because I had succeeded that far. That would make the complexity of a skill roll that takes an action for my abilities a complexity of four. It's, it's all about the success or failure. And if there is a success, then you keep going. And if it's a failure, that's basically when it stops. That is one of the most important things to remember. Nova abilities. Nova abilities can be activated at any time. And we haven't looked at this character's Nova abilities. So they have one called Lure the Masses. You can spend one Nova point while not in combat and while speaking to a group of people to convince them to take a course of action under the guise of their best interest. So this wouldn't happen inside of combat. Unseen, although, would. You can spend one Nova Point to become hidden from the senses of all creatures for up to 10 minutes or until you make an attack. So 
To use that Nova ability can be activated at any time in combat, including on other players' turns and on phase one or three. So this is a circumstance where a player could literally activate Unseen as you have a, an enemy approaching them. And it's a beautiful narrative moment because imagine them running towards their target, running towards the player, and the player activates Unseen by using the Nova Point they have from the different circumstances you gave them to build the Nova Points, and it just creates a fantastic storytelling moment. I really like seeing systems that enthuse what happens not just in a player's turn and giving the players the flexibility in their turn, a single turn that they share, to build up and work off of each other. There are only two exceptions. Nova abilities that require a skill roll can only be used during the activating character's turn. So because the Unseen did not require a skill roll, it did not require being activated on the player's turn. A lot of this game is a lot less about keeping track. Hmm. It's a lot less about keeping track of the different values that things have. And I'd say it's about knowing where to reference what the rules are because all of the rules that you will need are gonna be right in here. The combat is right there. All the different conditions, all the different currency, ideas for equipment, language, skills. All of that is right there. So movement in a general rule, it is each square is five feet, and then it literally gives us just the movement of squares. That is a pretty common thing, I feel like, and it is something I really like about Roll20, especially if you don't know this, one of the real values of playing on Roll20 is that you can actually gauge distance when you're moving a character around. One of my favorite things. So all of this has happened. Um, on the first time a player moves, they get one free movement, and then if they try to do it afterwards, that's when it would require something different. They can make additional movements by making additional skill rolls. And as usual, they can fail and the GM can make a failure situation or a collapse point. That, it's, it is a bunch of different options that the players have on their turn. It is not as much that you will need to keep track of when you are running this game, but it is information that they can reference. It is information that you can reference if you need it, there is a variety of actions, and at the end of the day, the system has told us many times the most important thing is that the GM and the player have that conversation about how they want to do something and how it works out. It's not solely about, this is your only attack stat. It's not solely about, this is your only defense stat. It's not solely about, this is the only way you can do this thing. It is about, these are the variety of narrative tools that your players have to use. How would you like to use them? That's the question that you can ask. How would you like this thing to happen? How would you like them to act? How would you like them to react? So we're gonna go into the move and resolve actions. This is when the enemies act. Once the players have completed their actions, all the remaining enemies can move their movement speeds and resolve the actions they declared in phase one. So previously I said, this character right here was going to attack. And they move one, two, three. Would not be above the movement. And now, this is when they make their attack. Enemy enemies that were reduced to zero health during phase two did not complete the action they declared. Any attacks that target a character who is no longer in the attack's range or were countered by an active defense skill miss. Enemies can move before and after their actions resolve but their total movement cannot exceed their speed. The enemy take their movement actions, inflict damage and or other effects from their attacks, and any other actions they declared missed. So let's see. I think I actually have... So I do. I actually have an enemy's character sheet right here. 
And you know what? I think I think this character runs up and genuinely just try to take a stab. They take a stab with a knife and it is concealable. So you know what? Oh, and do you see this? There is a roll attack button. So they're rolling. Uh, interesting. Mental skill. Complexity too. All right, all right. But this is the circumstance. Fingers crossed for me that this is a circumstance where my attack would actually work. Let's see. Wait, oh my gosh. I, see, it's, so this is, this is a moment of, this is a moment of excitement because it's remembering how much less I actually have to do. Because it's so ingrained in the head to have to make someone attack. But in this game, the enemies don't have to roll. And if that is not a selling point for you, I don't know what is. Because, again, the enemy does not have to roll. It is literally just saying, right there, target is overwhelmed by the thoughts, and then this is a circumstance where Eno would try to avoid literally being stabbed. And because I want to succeed, or I'm hoping to succeed, or I'm betting on succeeding, deception is something that this character is very good at. So reasonably, they're going to try, like I said, they're going to try to make a right move and then juke left. And it's a pass it would be a way that they could defend the action. And enemies do not have to roll at all. There was not a thing that Gabe had to roll extra. If I had five enemies, I don't have to do that extra roll. I don't have to keep track of all those extra stats. I keep track of it if the players attack the enemies. But other than that, no. So the enemies take their movement actions, inflict damage, any other actions, and that would literally be a round of combat. So this, just to proceed very quickly through, a very, very, very brief recap. This enemy would declare they are going to attack this character. That would be phase one. Phase two, this character gets to decide what they want to do. They could move closer and attack. If they have a ranged weapon, they could actually fire if they would like to. And you know what? They have a laser pistol. It has a range of 30. And the beauty of Roll20 being built in is that there is a ruler where you can measure all of this. And you know what? That is within range. The character is going to take a shot. Their range is not great, but we can hope. First shot, it's a pass. And they're going to take another action, take another shot. Second shot, it's a fail. So the first shot would succeed, the second shot would fail. And there's nothing else that the character really like could do because those were both of their actions. Third phase. This character follows its declared actions. One, two, three, four, five. And then this character would make an attack. This goes back to combat, literally saying the, where is it? Yes, it is saying that the enemies are attacking and then the players would decide how they avoid it, how they handle it, how they deal with it. It's the narrative conversation. And I had mentioned the deceive before. And I think that weapon was a complexity of two, actually. Of all the things. So that would be a fail. That would be a fail where actually if I was three, I'd go by down by one till two. And that's combat. That's it. That is, that is all of the base understanding you have to have for combat. 
It is the three phases. There is significantly more that can happen when you have more characters involved, when you have more players, when you have more options, when you have a variety of weapons, when you are surrounded in a different environment, when you are taking note of the environment that you have. Because I could have made a narrative where they are trying to knock them into the ship, or they are trying to trip them, or they are trying to stab them, or injure them, or something. But that is all of the complexity you would need to understand combat and run it for yourself. You can always build on, you can always add more pieces, but that alone gets you set up to run the combat for this game. That's one of my favorite, that's one of my many favorite parts, as I've said a few times. So advantage, yep, let me go back to that for you. So advantage is, it was saying, it's the strategic advantages players gain during an encounter. And when they gain advantages, um, when a player makes a, a successful skill roll during an encounter to gather information to or narratively improve their position, they gain an advantage. The advantages are kept in a shared pool and can be used by any player during an encounter. Oh yeah, yeah, it takes significantly more work. And the character have not maximum number of advantages. So advantages work in, in almost exactly the way that you would think they do. Um, it's, it's an extra chance to succeed. It's, it's genuinely just that. It's, I rolled that fail, and with the advantage, I wouldn't actually have failed. It's, and it's, it's nice because it's that, it's that quick and easy. This is, this is the game that, I've said that a few times, this is the game that as complicated as it might feel when you take the glimpse. There's a lot of stuff that you may have learned from RPGs previously that can translate to understanding it. And honestly, this is stuff that I've been I've been like delving into this for about a week. And I've been watching the different shows about it. And all of the start rules right there. If there's anything that I ever forgot, again, it's really nice that it's just right there. If there was something about combat that I could not remember for the life of me, I can go right here. I can make it, like, I can, I can edit this if I, for whatever reason, if I had to. So let's see. Yep, so player characters can use advantages as part of requirements for some species abilities, or they can reuse them, or they can use them to reroll any one die that was rerolled in a failed skill roll. If after that die is rerolled, there are no longer any doubles, the skill succeeds. So it's actually kind of nice because then it doesn't even give you like a chance to fail. It's, I, I had misspoken on that one. It literally would have just been rerolling that eight which will give you an even better chance to succeed. Advantages can be only gained and used during combat encounters. At the start of a combat encounter, the players have zero, and any left unspent are lost when the encounter ends. So let's go into health. We talked a little bit about health, and I talked about how it was lower, easier to work with, and I like that the numbers aren't like 100, 80, 50. Health levels measure the health of a character and represent their ability to take damage. Whenever damage is dealt to a character, it reduces the character's health levels. All damage affects the overall health levels of a creature. If a creature starts a battle with three health levels and gets hit with three attacks that deal one damage, these attacks reduce the character to zero health levels. All player characters have three health levels as their starting maximum. Yep, yeah, it is. so this encourages you to be creative, to give your characters creative circumstances and have 
strange, odd, unique fun in the best ways, and then figure out ways to reward them for it. It's the kind of game that if you're someone who wants to delve into role playing and you want a little bit more guide, this is probably going to be a good way to do it. Because then you're having the conversations, you're not just being told what you can or cannot do. Health levels cannot be reduced later than zero, lower than zero, and any creature who has zero health levels is knocked out, incapacitated, cowering in fear, or otherwise unable to take actions until they regain at least one health level. A player character with zero health levels does nothing on its turn, and cannot spend Nova points. So death and dying for PC characters. If a player character's health levels are reduced to zero, they receive the least severe type of negative condition that they do not already possess. For example, if a player is reduced to zero health levels and they have no condition, they gain a minor negative condition. If they ha already have a minor condition when they're reduced to zero levels, they gain a moderate negative condition. Let me tell you why this is nice. A lot of circumstances and games will give your players situations that they can just die outright. And many people may enjoy that. And you could change the guidelines for this game if that's the way you wanted to do it. But this game is specifically outlining that when you are dropped to zero, it does not mean that you die. It does not mean that getting into a combat situation and dropping down, potentially in like the first hour of gameplay, does not mean that your character is gone and dead. I don't like killing player characters. I really don't. I feel bad about it very often. So I like this because this is a circumstance where if they go down, something happens, but they do not outright have to just treat their character as dead and gone. So they go to a minor condition and then they gain a moderate condition the second time it happens. Then the third time, it becomes a significant condition. If a player a character has a minor, moderate, and severe negative condition, and their health levels are reduced to zero, that is when the character dies. So if the GM, and it, it notes, if the GM characters, the creatures and such, are reduced to zero health levels, it means they're out of, it means they're out of commission. At least until the end of the combat encounter, so they don't have to be dead either unless you want to. The attacker decides, the player that's active decides if they want to knock the enemy out or kill them outright. This is giving a sense of player agency. This is giving a sense of player narrative experience, a player narrative growth. It's not about deciding if they have to state lethal, non-lethal damage, so on. They like they don't have to state that before. They can be like, I this is what I'm trying to do with this character. This is what I want to do with this character. And so on. So I mentioned earlier that you can make failure conditions when your players fail a roll, or you can take a collapse point. Collapse points are an extra way the GM can make enemies more powerful and represent the universe itself collapsing around the players. At the start of every combat encounter, the GM has two collapse points. So right off the bat, when you start, you have two points that you can use. The GM can choose to gain one collapse point every time a player fails a skill roll in lieu of enforcing a consequence. Player characters must be very careful about how they push themselves. So we talked previously that if you continue to succeed a skill roll, you can just keep going. You can just keep going indefinitely until you fail. This is the reason as to why you might not want to keep going. Because if you always make actions until you fail, then you will be continuously giving the GM, me, collapse points. And I'm not going to complain. I will gladly take them. But it could be a circumstance where you were like, I made two successful attack rolls, and I'm going to stop there. Because if I keep going, it's even more risky, and I don't want to give that extra. The collapse points can be used in the following ways. Declare an extra attack. By spending one collapse point, the GM can declare an extra attack from an enemy or creature. They can use that ability during phase one or two. 
So after they were hit, you can decide, you know what, this person would actually make two attacks on you. If the GM is using that ability in phase two, there must be at least one player character who has yet to finish their turn. If players have already taken all their turn, the GM cannot add extra collect points until the next combat round. Or, some enemy NPCs have special abilities or attacks that can only be activated by the GM spending collapse points. These are very similar to Nova points, but are well named collapse to be more the opposite end of the spectrum, because the NPCs will have their own special abilities. But, just like advantages, it does disappear at the end of combat. And yes, uh, so you can get treatments to alleviate the conditions, or you can actually um, take the time to recover it. We've talked a little bit about consequences. Um, consequences are more just building the narrative of how something failed. And honestly, the best suggestion is make it as fun as you can. We are here to have fun and your players are here to have fun and they're here to have a good time and they're curious and interested. So if they fail something, it doesn't have to mean that everything falls apart, but there could be a circumstance where they fail to deceive someone and maybe they have a Freudian slip and actually give their real name instead of the fake name. It does not automatically mean that everything is going to go wrong, but it does mean that they are in a little bit of danger. They are in a little bit more trouble. There can be allied NPCs that you give the player characters. And if you do those sorts of things, the allied NPCs do act in the same phase as the player characters. They will act in phase two instead of phase three. That makes them, a, that, that gives them the same agency that the players have. It gives them the ability to work together with the players and it gives them to act together with the players to support each other. Let's see. We, so we covered combat. We went through the character mancer. We went through the ship combat. But we haven't talked as much about the different ships. This is an exciting moment to watch your players build an experience. There are different parts of a spaceship. And on the spaceship map, as we see right here, they're even outlined, the different parts. There's the cockpit, the whoo, cockpit. This is the outlined area where a creature must be to pilot the ship. During spaceship combat, there are specific actions that can be taken by creatures in this area. Outside of combat situations that require fine control, the MI can pilot the vessel. And if you're curious, MI refers to magical intelligence. Engine. This is the outlined area where a creature can control the engine output of the ship. Every ship has at least one engine. During ship combat, there are specific actions that can be taken by creatures in an engine area. MI Jack. The outline area is a hardwired point to where a creature can attach themselves to the ship and move into the magical intelligence space. The magical place where the ship's magical intelligence lives. This allows them to directly interact with and defend the MI. Every ship has at least one MI Jack. So your ships are alive. In a way. Customizable areas. These are outlined areas on the ship where the players can install modules to truly make a vehicle of their own. So this is a circumstance where you can give your players something new to build onto the ship that they have that they want. It gives them a sense of customization and you can create dozens of different ideas. There is an infinite number of possibilities you can do for it. And so we have the sectors. Each spaceship is divided into sectors. The sectors are areas of the ship that can be blocked off in the event of a fire or hull breach. Each sector can be blocked off to contain the damage, and you would have to contain the damage uh, if you can only manage so much. So we have sector four down here, three, two, and then one. So these are the different sectors that could be blocked off of the ship depending on the damage that you have to deal with. Is there anything else that you want me to cover while I'm still here before I keep going into the spaceships? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm a huge fan of ship customization. So, okay, I talked about the magical intelligence. 
The space on the ship is a visual representation of the space where the ship's magical intelligence lives. This is not a physical space, but a magical plane of existence where characters can go directly to interact with the MI. The player characters can talk to the MI while inside the ship or from anywhere by using communication badges. So this is essentially the AI that you have to communicate. As a GM, I may or may not have a few different voice modules that this would be very heavily involved with, that I would literally just want to come up with an AI personality, or I just, oh, I, this is, this is the thing that I would personally want art of the most. I want to know what the magical intelligence of different player ships would look like. <laughs> during a gameplay token, uh, during gameplay, a token for the MI should always be located in the zone. If a creature enters the zone, they can jack into the MI space. When a creature does this, their token should remain in the MI jack, and a second token for the creature should be placed in the MI space to represent their spirit. So there are literally circumstances where you can get into the MI space, but you may also be needing to be inside of there so that you can defend your magical intelligence. What does the magical intelligence look like? What does it sound like? Does it have a specific personality? Is it the quirky, friendly, overzealous character? Or are they... Is your ship a little difficult, so to speak? Yeah. And then there's even the question, what is the ship's name? How long has the ship been flying? How old is the ship? This, everything that I've talked about here so far makes playing in this game genuinely talk about building it together. Because when we're talking about the character creation and the character story path, the story path is deciding what the players want to have narratively in the game. When you have the ship, you're coming up with a place that they live, a home of theirs, a place they come back to, essentially their sanctuary, the place that they might fight off people and travel to and from different places. The ability to keep acting over and over and then not treat failure as a loss. Tra failure, yes, failure is not a loss. Failure is an advantage for GM. That's, that's what I would argue about this game. If you fail, it is not a loss. It is simply creating an advantage for the GM uh, in any sense. So you have the ship exterior. The area of the ship is divided into eight zones, near and far on all four sides. These zones are where other ships are located during spaceship combat, and they move about the zones during combat. They may start here. They may move in. They may come around to the front. Then they may go to the starboard near and then starboard far. Player characters are not capable of entering these zones without risking death unless they have species abilities, spells, or equipment that allow them safely to be in space. So there's a lot that goes into the customizing modules. There are combat modules. <laughs> there are different statistics and that you can add to your ship. There is so much to explore in this game. You could literally have me talking for hours and I almost wish that I would. But I want to get through this just in case there's anything else and just so I can also give you the rest of the information just so you have it. There are MI levels. This is the health of the ship that's determined by the magical intelligence that runs the ship. We have a pre-generated ship we can look at here. Right here, it has health levels. Then there's livability. So health levels, literally again, the health of the ship, when it takes damage from attacks, it might go down. When it reaches zero, the ship goes dark and the MI dies. When the ship goes dark, all modules, engines, cockpit, stop working. And the life support systems have enough power to keep functioning for 10 days. It's horrifying. Livability. The ship is home for the player characters. Being crammed into a ship full of turrets and weapons is not a great standard of living. Characters do not have good places to rest on their ship, they can't be at their best. Dynamics represent the livability rating. Mechanically speaking, the players cannot gain more advantage than the livability rating. Sealed Argent. 
and unsealed argent. Sealed argent is the amount of argent the team has decided to seal away and let the colony grow. The player characters can seal away as much as they like, and the amount increases by 10% every 100 days. You literally have a bank on your ship that literally accrues interest. What game does that? <laughs> it's amazing. But then unsealed argent. Unsealed argent is the amount of argent to which your team has immediate access. This is the preference I have in a lot of my games. I like the idea of a shared money pool that everyone can access. That is what this unsealed argent value is. This unsealed argent value is the value that all of the players have access to at the same time. And then you could decide, you know what? We're actually going to take some of that unsealed argent. We're going to take 6,000 and stock it away in our sealed argent. We're going to take it away and stock it on the bank. The money is all stored on your ship, essentially. And you have an entire pool for the players to use. It is not focused on one player being richer than the other. It is focused on all of the players having a total amount that they use together. And then every 100 days, there's a 10% increase. So every 100 days, this 6,000, it would take 10% and it actually gain an extra 600. So literally, it's also inspiring role play for longer games to have more and more. And actually, narratively speaking, it makes me draw a lot of interest if there was a circumstance where players found a very old ship with a lot of sealed argent. I, I can't stop. Um, ooh, but that's interesting. I would like to see someone write about that. Because then if you find a very old ship that has a lot of argent, let's say there was literally 400,000 on the ship. How long has it been there? Whose is it? Why has it been there so long? And then what is the magical intelligence like? So to repair and rearm your ship, you must dock at a spaceport. When the ship docks to repair, its MI levels and health are restored. Any all turrets that have ammo requirements refilled, damage modules repair, typically cost about 500 argent and take eight hours of work. If a ship's MI ceases to exist, a new one can be installed in the ship if the ship is towed to a spaceport. A new one typically costs 20,000 and takes one day's work to install. If a spaceship is stopped at a spaceport and does not need repairs or rearming, it can usually dock at a spaceport without charge. The only way to recover health levels for your ship's MI is through paying for repairs. <laughs> you know what? That would be the only circumstance I would really enthuse math. Doing the math to figure out how long the ship had been there. You have a little adventure about a planet suffering megastorms from an encounter with the burn that has a large argent holding from the overgilds. Well, that's the combo of heist and natural disaster movie. Nice. So there's, there's plenty that goes into building your spaceship. Different turrets um, and different weapons to build on it. There is the bolt, there is the predator, there is the wanderer. You literally start off with ships that exist. And if you're someone that wants to be creative, if you're someone that wants to give your players something new, you can make ships. And, and genuinely, the ship that you would make. It outlines everything that you would need. You would give them customizable sections. You would give them ship sectors. You would give them engines. You would give them an MI jack, and you would give them a cockpit. So what I would love to see is I would love to see people who are making these games also making custom ships. Because it's not saying the visual design of it has to be anything else. These are the pieces that you need for the ship. And then, as the players customize it, you can do anything that you want. You don't even have to decide on all of the weapons for a ship if you're not feeling up to it. It could be a scout ship. It could be a freighter ship. 
there could be an extensive amount of size to it. So what, what kind of ships do you have in mind? What kind of ships will you create? And what kind of ships will you give them as an offering? Do different ships, do different sizes have different types of MI? Are they inspired by different types of MI? Possibilities are endless. Exchanging a ship. When your ship is docked at a place where you can get repairs at the GM's discretion, you can change in your ship for another starting type, provided your current ship is not in need of repairs. When you get your new ship, if you can transfer the components you had to your old ship over for a fee of 100 Argent per component. So this is a circumstance where it's telling you if your players decide they want to build onto the ship they have, they can transfer those things to any new ship that they get. They don't just automatically lose them. It's giving a sense of longevity for what they want to do with the ship. And these are a bunch of different modules you can include. You can have a cryo chamber. Player characters can put themselves in temporary cryo freeze to pass the time of long space travels instantly. Increase the livability rating of a ship by one. Additionally, cryo chambers can be used to hold prisoners without the possibility of escape. The cryo chamber can hold up to four size one creatures at a time. I mean, I talked about before, you could have a ship that has a ridiculous amount of Argent on it. And if they had a cryo chamber included, there could be a character right inside of there. What story does that person have to tell when they wake up? What do they have to say? Do they know where they are? Do they have any memory of who they are? There are plenty of modules that you can include. I genuinely think that if you've never run a tabletop game and you want to try doing it, Burn Bright is the one to at least give it a shot for. Considering how everything here is digitally available for you, there are handouts for pretty much any question you could ask. And even if there is a decent bit of text, it's separated so that it makes it significantly easier. Even if you click conditions, right at the top, quick mechanical reference for conditions. If you click skills, quick mechanical reference for skills. This game was literally designed with the focus of fun and it said it. This game was designed with the focus of safety and it said it. There is an extensive, extensive detail that went into the creation of this game. There is no real loss for failure, but it gives the GM more tools to work with. If you use a variety of skills in your roles and you give your players those circumstances, if you're like, you know what? What kind of thing, what kind of skill do you think fits this? You open up that narrative, you ask those questions and and they come up with the idea, you know what, maybe I will use that thing that I use very often. Maybe I will use that thing I'm not very good at and just see what happens. When you give them those opportunities, you give them that moment, you give them that excitement, you help them become more comfortable. You help create new things. We looked at the fact that you can have ships and that the location of where you are on the ship is important that not one person can have a role like it is roles are not roles are not forced to be individualized you can have multiple people doing the same role you can have people switch around different roles you can optimize if you want depending on what skills you think are more important but it's not that you're picking something and you have to stay into that mold there are story paths that are a guide for the player and the GM to figure out what story they want to tell. There is the character mancer that pretty much answers any question you have just from going through it. And if it doesn't answer it in the character mancer, all of these guides on the right, if there's a single note related to it, if you're looking for something on skills or equipment or, or character advancement, it's all there. I, I'm excited about this system because this is what I want to see more people running. And I want to see more people running it, especially because it's giving people tools that don't inquire, that don't require them to keep up with a number game. 
it's giving people tools that don't require a GM to have to memorize how many attack rolls someone needs. It's giving players the circumstance and agency to do everything they want to do together and then the GM to act afterwards. There are already two shows, like I said, Burning Daylight, which comes on Thursdays at 7 p.m. on our Twitch channel, and Act Against the Stars, an actual play produced and presented by Salty Suit Games, Tuesday at 6 p.m. PT. So actually today, if you stick around, and well, if you come back at 7 p.m. today, you'll get a glimpse of, of why this is so, of why it works. And I, I can genuinely assure, even just from listening and taking a look at this, if you watched and saw what they were doing, you know exactly how they're playing. This is a game where the dice assume that you're good at what you do. You're rolling just by chance to see if you would fail. And personally, I'd say this game says if you're going to fail, we're going to show you how you can fail upwards. So if you get a chance, check out Roll 20's Burn Bright. You can go to burnbright.com. Uh, you can even go to Twitter, go to Roll20, and there are plenty of different Burn Bright things on there right now. Even if you go to the YouTube channel, you can check some of the episodes that have played previously, but check it out. If nothing else, maybe someone else would be interested in it, and who doesn't love space? I enthuse, you give it a chance, and then let me know what you think. Stay strong, enjoy space, and definitely keep running bright. Stare oblivion in the face and dare to hope. Burn Bright is the first ever tabletop role-playing game made exclusively for and by Roll20. It's a science fantasy role-playing game that takes place in the Olaxis galaxy. Olaxis is a place of fantastic creatures, magic-powered tech, and ancient ruins. The problem? This is the last galaxy in existence, and it's shrinking. A bright orange phenomenon called the burn surrounds and closes in on Alaxis, wiping out anything it touches. Anyone's home could be next. Resources grow scarce as planets are lost to the phenomenon. Refugees struggle to find welcoming spaceports. Wars are fought over the planets at Alexis's center, the last to be taken by the burn. And the ever-diminishing edge of the galaxy is rife with criminals and bizarre space-faring monsters chased by the burn from parts unknown. To make matters worse, greedy villains exploit panic caused by the burn for profit. That's where you come in. Each player builds a character, selecting one of Burnbright's eight original species, like a super-focused crystalline Ulrin, a sapient mecha called a Peacecraft, or a swarm of tiny telepathic insects that share a hive mind known as the Rornin. Yeah, that's right, you can be a swarm. Your characters put it all on the line to help those in need. The end of the universe is no reason to stop having a heart, and overwhelming odds are no reason to abandon hope. Beat corruption with a sonic caber and shield the innocent with force fields as you travel the galaxy in your customizable spaceship. As your characters adventure, they grow more powerful, gaining skill upgrades, new species traits, and completing story paths. Each story path is a unique five element plot that grants your character unique abilities. The outcome of each event determines how your character's power increases. When you finish the story path, you can immediately start a new one. Good thing there's 40 to choose from. Tracking your character's progression, conditions, 
and gear is easy with Roll20's fully integrated Burn Bright character sheet and compendium. Building your character is fast and easy thanks to Roll20's Character Mancer. Hey, even your crew's spaceship has a character sheet for tracking shared resources and upgrades. Game Masters, you focus on your player's characters. Roll20 can take care of the rules. Instantly roll fistfuls of virtual dice and easy to understand resolutions. Build custom character adventures with less prep time by letting your character's story paths guide you. You can pick up the core rules, map tile packs, and a starter adventure called Burning Daylight, which comes with quick start rules, pre-generated characters, and dynamic lighting ready maps, so you can jump right into the game and take on a mysterious cult that worships the burn. You can purchase the core rules, map pack, and adventure separately, or get it all in our Burn Bright Mega Bundle, which saves you 10 bucks and gives you access to an exclusive character art pack. I know what you're thinking. Don't worry, more Burn Bright content is coming after launch. I can't wait to see you in Alaxis. Let's dare to hope. <laughs>